They bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. Welcome to Westside Online. My name is Kristen Woods, and I am one of the pastors at Westside, and we are thrilled to have you join us today. If you are a regular part of our Westside community, we want to welcome you back and are glad you can join us. For some of you, this may be your first time joining with us, or maybe even your first time exploring church, and we are honored that you would do that with us today. Our desire is to be a Jesus-centered church. This means that rather than focusing on what might divide us, we believe that what is good for us all is our collective journey towards Jesus, both personally and as a community. Just to give you a sense of what to expect in our service, we will spend about 60 minutes together with part of the time being spent with a band. Then you'll get to hear from one of our teachers and we'll also guide you in some readings and creeds. But the real purpose of our online gathering is to help you feel welcome as you participate with our Westside community. If you are in the Calgary area or are watch from afar and ever find yourself in Calgary, we would love to have you join us in person. And if after watching today you have any questions about who we are or questions about faith, or maybe you want to just simply chat with one of our pastors, we would love to talk with you. You can get a hold of us by filling out our contact page on our website at wkc.org slash contact. Now, we would encourage you to say hello in the comments below and to engage with some of our team members there. It's a great space to ask questions or even have someone pray for you if needed. Now, the service is about to begin, but we want to say again, we are so glad that you have joined us today and welcome to Westside King's Church online. If you are able, would you all stand to prepare yourselves for worship this Palm Sunday? Grace and peace to you from God. 
Dear friends in Christ, during Lent we have been preparing for the celebration of Christ's death and resurrection. Today we come together to begin this solemn celebration in union with the church throughout the world. Christ entered Jerusalem this day in triumph, a triumph that led through suffering and death to resurrection and new life. In faith and love, may we follow this Messiah, the humble ruler who comes riding on a donkey. Like all of our services during Holy Week, this service will look a little different than most weeks. We invite you to lean in, engage, and hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. So let us pray together. God of our salvation, help us to enter with joy into the celebration of those mighty acts by which you have given us fullness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Do 
As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of the Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went out and found a coat outside in the street tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying the colt? They answered, as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clocks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their clocks on the road, while others spread the branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. in a tradition of having kids with the palm branches in your church, but we are really excited that the kids are going to join us in just a minute with their palm branches singing Hosanna. And um, as they, when they come in, we're going to actually sing one of the songs that they sing together in the East Hall. And you're gonna, this is where you like kind of get in touch with your inner child because there's clapping and there's hand waving and drums and guitar. And this is where you just lean into it. It's okay. We're all going to do it. It's going to be really fun. And um, we're going to sing Hosanna with the kids in just a minute. But as the kids are coming, we want to pray for our children this morning. So join me in prayer. Oh God, we praise you for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. On this day, 
he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was hailed as king by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. As we welcome our children carrying branches, we ask that they may be for us signs of his victory. Grant that we may ever hail him as our king and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hosanna to the son of David, the king of Israel. Hosanna in the highest. So here we go. As this video starts, we'll sing along and the kids are going to come and join us on the stage. Yeah, that's all right. You can clap your hands. You can move a little for this one. Hosanna, oh, oh, Hosanna. So we have Raphael and Connor. They're going to lead you guys in the Lord's Prayer. Are you guys ready? Okay. And Emery. Come on over. Okay, you guys ready? Okay. Our Father. I think we can be more congratulatory for their great work, can't we? <laughs> you guys were amazing. Just give that to you, Christy. You can have a seat. There are like moments in your, in your sort of pastoral life where you have to, 
you have to come and talk after something, and you're like, how can I get up and talk after that? Like, you know, there's like show stealing uh, sort of moment. It's great to have you with us this morning for Palm Sunday. Uh, if you remember all the way back at Ash Wednesday, we sort of announced the start of Lent, and, and at that point, you know, everybody's sort of attitude was, why are we already thinking about Easter? It's so far away, and now here we are, the beginning of Holy Week. Easter is next Sunday. So I wanted to just let you know a little bit about things that are happening this week. Church life gets, a, gets very varied, and there's lots of opportunities to engage uh, throughout Holy Week. Obviously, this morning we're here. It's Palm Sunday. Uh, tomorrow evening, actually, our, four, our grades four and fives are, are welcome to be here and, and journey through Stations of the Cross at a level that's uh, appropriate for them. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday in the, in the West Hall, we, we set the space up very differently, and it's the space for you to come anywhere between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. Come whenever suits you. And just take a little bit of time to journey through the story of Jesus' steps up to the cross. Uh, it, it's a beautiful way, actually, to kind of bring your whole body present to what's going on in Holy Week, rather than just sort of rushing through as life tends to do it. So try and find yourself a moment. Some people sneak out a lunch break. Some people come in on their way home from work, or they adjust their schedule. You know, tell your boss you're working from home, and just come to the stations of the cross. Jesus will forgive you, I promise and uh, uh, so that's, that's Tuesday from 11 through till 7 p.m. Wednesday, also 11 through till 7 p.m. And this is guided by yourself. You'll come, there's a booklet. It kind of guides you through the story of Jesus on his way to the cross with places to pray, pause, and reflect. If that's a little like, oh, I'm not sure I'd be able to do that, on Wednesday night at 7, we do a guided Stations of the Cross. This is where you can come along, and we'll actually take you through the journey of the stations and, and sort of teach you how to pray in, in that particular space so that next year you can come back and do it all by yourself. It's a beautiful time, actually, on Wednesday evening at 7, so please, uh, please lean into that with us. Our young people, uh, as part of the youth program, will be engaging with stations as well. Then we get to Monday, Thursday. Now, Monday, Thursday is the traditional day where the church remembers the first Eucharist. Jesus had a meal with his disciples before his crucifixion, and that's the first Eucharist in history. So what we're doing this year is across Thursday, Friday, and Sunday, we're sort of trying to follow and track with the story. So the Eucharist, which we have sometimes in the past, we've done that on Good Friday morning, but actually this year, we're pulling it back to Thursday evening. So we'll do Eucharist together on Thursday evening. But before we do Eucharist on Thursday evening, we're going to have some food together because the first Eucharist was done at a meal. So come at 6.30, eat with us. Now, I'm actually not sure what the food is just yet. I, I suggested steak. Um, <laughs> but then finance shut me down and they were like, no. Uh, and so, uh, so I come and be surprised by the food. Uh, we'll, we'll eat together, uh, then we'll, we'll take a, a Eucharist liturgy together, we'll remember Jesus' death around the table as Christians have from the first Last Supper to now, and then we'll, what we'll do is we'll participate in a small liturgy known as the stripping of the altar, where we'll clean the altar space back to uh, just a, a bare table, and that holds us in memory of what's happening over Easter weekend. So Monday, Thursday will be a gorgeous night to be with us, then we'll gather together for Good Friday, Good Friday is not a Eucharist service. It's a service where we ponder, pause, and reflect the death of Jesus upon the cross for us. I think for many of us, it's our tradition to come here on Good Friday and, and just commemorate Jesus at, at 11 a.m. And I'd encourage you to keep doing that with us because it's always a beautiful moment of our Christian calendar year here at Westside. Then we hold a pause on Holy Saturday, and we'll be back here at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. for Easter Sunday to celebrate the fact that we already know how this story is going. No spoilers, Jesus is risen, and we're going to be super excited about that on Easter Sunday morning. So, as I said, it's a kind of busy week. There's a lot going on. What I'd love you to do is just take a moment just now and have a look at that. Do two things for us. Pray for all of the things that our staff are working on to make this possible, to serve you, our congregation, throughout this week. And then have a think about what can you participate in this Holy Week. Not because we just want you to participate in stuff, but because we want you to join in with the story and, and find the depth of what Christ is doing for us constantly that, that, that became so real for us throughout the Easter weekend. We have giving stations around the room. We're always grateful for your generosity to us to help us do everything that we do at Westside. So please take a moment to visit them or use one of our online uh, processes. And we thank you for your constant generosity towards us. But it is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday tells the arrival of a new king, the king of kings, the prince of peace. 
And now we're going to come and we're going to pass the peace with one another. Now, why do we do this? Actually, one sense, Palm Sunday is a great day to remind us of why we do this. I often like to think of the passing of the peace as a bit of Christian resistance. If you spend any time watching the world around us, it doesn't seem very peaceful. Uh, and so coming here and wishing one another the peace of Christ doesn't always feel like it's rooted in reality. But the king that we welcome on Palm Sunday reminds us of another reality, of something beyond the mess of the world right now. So when we wish one another peace, what we're saying to one another is, the way it is right now, God's not finished yet. There will be a day where peace will be present for all of us. And right now, when we wish one another peace, we're reminding of ourselves that the Easter story is true, that Christ is coming back, and things will be different. So why don't you stand with me for a moment? And hear these beautiful words of hope. The peace of the Lord be with you always. So continue to wish one another grace and peace. Visit one of the giving stations if you can. Young people, you're going to go to your program right now. Have a great time at that. We'll see you back here at Eucharist. And we're going to take a small break before we continue with our Palm Sunday service. Okay. Oh, okay.
Let's be quiet now for a reading from the text. A reading from the letter to the Philippians. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Hosanna in the highest indeed. It is Holy Week. We have arrived. And what we want to do at the beginning of this Holy Week is actually embrace the Easter, the Easter liturgical traditions of the church. And one of the ways that we do this on Palm Sunday traditionally is to limit our own words and actually allow ourselves instead to lean into the words of Scripture. Sometimes there can be a tendency, and I realize that you're welcome to point out the irony of it, me being me that says this, but sometimes there can be a tendency to read less Scripture and talk more about Scripture. We're going to invert that today and spend our time reading Scripture together. Scripture tells us the story the story that we're here for, the reason we're in this room is because of the story of Holy Week. And scripture tells us that story. And as we continue to journey our renewal as a church, we are constantly learning to trust the spirit, trust the sacraments, and of course, trust scripture as well to bring us constantly into the presence of Jesus. So for this morning, in place of the sermon, we're gonna tell the story of Holy Week. We're going to offer you what the great preacher Fleming Rutledge calls unfiltered gospel. We'll read. There'll be moments for you to respond. Sometimes in words, they'll come on the screen in bold, as you're familiar with, sometimes in song. And this will lead us up to the table where we'll celebrate the hope that we have in Christ because of the story that we now tell. Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. They said, But not during the festival, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and say to the owner of the house that he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, 
went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me? It is one of the twelve, the one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in new kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus told them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ, have have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. Is all I have worth. I'll break it at your feet, Lord. There's less than you deserve. If I'm more beautiful, more precious than the oil, the sum of my desires and the fullness of my joy. Like you spilled your blood. I spill my heart as an offering to my King. Here I am, take me as an offering. Here I am, giving every heart. 
They went to a place. You can be seated. <laughs> they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed to sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The man seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus was quoting the prophet Daniel about himself. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, You also were with that Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them. I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. 
and he broke down and wept. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Would you stand with us, please? be seated. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, who asked, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so. The chief priests accused Jesus of many other things. So again, Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer? 
See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Pilate knew it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate released, release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? The people shouted, Why? What crime has he committed? But they shouted all the louder. <laughs> Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him. Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him amongst themselves. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was the preparation day. That is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Jesus, to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid.
almighty and ever-living God. In your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This is the story that brings us to the table. We narrate this story in its heaviness and its weight. We promised you unfiltered gospel. And I wonder for how many of us, as we just hear the story read from start to finish, how as we begin this Holy Week, what Christ has done for us lands differently on our hearts, in our minds, and in our spirits. One of my friends said to me this week that Jesus will always disappoint us by being the kind of king that we would never choose for ourselves. Think about Palm Sunday. We want this Jesus to come in strong and powerful and he arrives broken. He arrives poured out. We expect a king to come and solve the problems of all of our enemies, and instead he dies for our enemies. We're used to seeing kings ride in strong on top of horses and looking down at everybody, and Jesus rides in on a donkey, which I think is the only animal that you can ride on and not gain any height whatsoever. You're still eye to eye with everybody. Jesus will always disappoint us by being the kind of king we would never choose for ourselves. I was thinking about how these altars that we see around the world, perhaps you visited them on your vacation, these amazing temples of, of the ancient world. I love going seeing museum exhibits about them. Perhaps you watch documentaries about these great Greek temples or ancient temples. And you would walk into these huge buildings and, and as you come into them somewhere in the middle generally or at the front, there'll be this massive altar and an image and a statue of the God. And it's all designed to create this sense of your smallness and the God's greatness. And then you come and follow the way of Jesus. And on the altar is not an image of greatness and power in the way that we're used to seeing greatness and power. Instead on the altar is, a, is an image of Jesus broken and poured out of body bruised and blood shed. Like Jesus will always disappoint you if you want him to be the type of king you see elsewhere. But here's the thing about the kings we see elsewhere. They're always the ones we choose for ourselves and they always fail us. Whether the king is born through some royal succession or whether the king is just called a president and we vote them in, or a prime minister and we vote them in, they will always disappoint you. They will always fail you, even the ones you like. But Jesus calls us to something different. In body broken and in blood poured out, we realize this is maybe not the king we would have chosen. But my goodness, he's the king we need. In your week, perhaps he's disappointed you. You had prayers and you knew exactly, if you pray like me, I know exactly how God needs to fix things. My, my prayers are mostly just maps for Jesus. First Jesus do this, then Jesus do that, and everything will be fine. And Jesus disappoints me regularly by doing it not how I've asked him to, but in another way, or apparently doing nothing at all. And perhaps your prayers for healing, perhaps your prayers for a situation at work, a situation in your family, some sort of thing you're facing. Perhaps Jesus is disappointing you right now. What we find at the table is a reminder that this is Jesus, broken, poured out, not as we expect, but doing what we need. So there's a sense when we gather on Palm Sunday, we call our hearts to remember that Jesus is always acting for us. When we pray in a few moments, come Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus always answers that prayer. We're never alone, never abandoned. But Jesus might not do things the way that we want him to. So as I invite you into this Palm Sunday Eucharist prayer, I invite you to bring your disappointments, 
Bring the places where you feel like you're on your own and come to the table knowing that Jesus that we meet here is the Jesus that we need. He's the king that we need. He's the prince of peace that we need. And even though he might look disappointing to how we've been trained to understand kings and power and hope, he is exactly what you, me, and the world need. So let us pray this prayer with the hope and the weight of Holy Week upon us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good to offer our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. To give you thanks, Holy Father and Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty, the power of the life-giving cross and the triumph of Christ crucified. He, Jesus, is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you, saying, holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. They cried then and we cry it now. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. The tree of shame was made the tree of glory. Where life was lost, there life has been restored. Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. And so, Father God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here. Pour out your Spirit on us and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, Father God, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one for all the world. All this we ask through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. We do all this because of Holy Week. We come to this altar to have body broken, blood poured out because of the story we've told today. This is the ground of our being. It's the ground of our hope. We are Christians because of this. We hope in Christ because of this. So we say this regularly at Westside, but let me say it really clearly this morning. Don't exclude yourself from the table. Lean into the mystery of the table, of the disappointing God. Because if you're anything like me, you're probably disappointed with yourself from time to time. So meeting a God who is disappointing might be exactly what you need. Meeting a God who won't show you power, but will show you brokenness. Meeting a God who won't just be distant from you, but his blood is poured out into our earth, into our ground and saving us. So lean into the mystery of the table, lean into the mystery of the God who loves you, don't give yourself an excuse not to come to him today. Perhaps you hear this invitation that we love to say here at Westside, that this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often 
and you who have not been here long, you who have tried to follow, and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Jesus, true vine and bread of life, ever giving yourself that the world might live. Let us share your death and passion and make us perfect in your love. Amen. Friends, these, these simple gifts are the gifts of God for you and me, the people of God. I'm gonna invite you to stand. Stand in the mystery of this table, stand in the mystery of this holy story and lean in to worship Jesus. If this is your first time with us, this works very simply. There'll be two pastors at the front and two in the middle. You just come down the middle aisles with your hands in a receiving posture. We'll dip the bread into the cup and serve it on your hands with the word, the body and blood of Christ. And you can respond with amen or thanks be to God. If you need an allergy aware bread, just let your server know and we'll help you with that. But for now, just lean in in song and in worship and let's celebrate the King who has saved us all.
if you have been faithful on all my life you've been so so good with every breath that i am able i will sing of the goodness of god yes i will sing of the goodness Of the goodness of God. There is a hill I cherish. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and that obedience died on the cross for our salvation. 
Give us the mind to follow you and proclaim you as Lord and King. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. I hear this blessing. A blessing for Palm Sunday and for Holy Week. May the Father who so loved the world that he gave his only Son bring you by faith to his eternal life. May Christ, who accepted the cup of sacrifice and obedience to the Father's will, keep you steadfast as you walk with him the way of his cross. May the Spirit who strengthens us to suffer with Christ that we may share his glory set your minds on life and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and be with you now and forevermore. Amen and amen. And perhaps you hear these words differently because it's Palm Sunday, this great celebration of the very different God. But hear this, go in the grace and peace of Christ into this holy week. Thanks be to God, amen. Go with God's grace and peace this holy week. Take space, time to reflect, journey. Join us if you're able. We'll see you here throughout the week. God bless.